Good evening. Uh, by way of an introduction, um, uh, I'm Michael Bracewell. Um, you know, you could make a pretty good case for the fact that Pet Shop Boys have written more great pop songs than any group other than the Beatles. Their songs observe, celebrate, lament, and challenge the modern world, and the stage is on life's way. Now, in my opinion, some of the best writing to emerge in the 1980s didn't come out of the world of literature. It actually came out of the world of pop. Now, that's not to say that pop music suddenly went intellectual. It didn't. And as we all know, pop music is gloriously a four-minute form. It's dedicated to inspiration and chance and influence and an awful lot of just sheer hard showbiz graft. It's like David Bowie said, you know, there's a lot of Woolworths in Ziggy. But a handful of artists emerged, I think particularly during the years just following punk, so the like first half of the 1980s, a handful of artists emerged who could not only write great pop songs, but they could make pop songs do the work of literature, even great literature, really. And foremost among these artists, in my opinion, were Neil Tennant, and Chris Lowe. Now, it's no exaggeration to say that Pet Shop Boys songs, hit after hit, album after album, they can be listened to as just fabulous, gorgeous, pulse-quickening, thrilling, fun pop music, or catch them in the right mood, and it's a bit like reading a big dynastic novel of our times. So, with the publication now, today, uh, of 100 lyrics and a poem, by reading Neil's lyrics on the page, we can understand a bit more about the pop genius of Pet Shop Boys and the wit and the range and the sheer brilliance of Neil's writing. So, I see it as my job this evening to try to say as little as possible uh, and try to encourage our guest to say as much as possible um, but could we please all begin by welcoming the absolutely wonderful Neil Tennant. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's enough. That's enough. <clears throat> right, well, just to kill that off, I'm going to begin with a really serious question. So, here we go. Neil, a bit of background. Um, I was talking to our mutual friend, John Savage, not so long ago. And we were saying how for our parents, if you were born in the 50s, the early 60s, for our parents and our grandparents, their great generational experience was world war. And ours was pop music. That was the big event that our generation rallied around. Do you think that's true? Well, it's certainly one of them. I mean, when I was a child growing up in Newcastle, in the uh, particularly the, in the 60s, pop music was for, for me and my sister the most important thing. You know, we lived in the era of the Beatles and the Tamil Motown and the Stones, and all the family would gather around on a Sunday afternoon and listen to Pick of the Pops with Alan Freeman. And it was a sort of a, a national issue. And uh, my parents are dead now, but my mother, until the day she died, always took an interest in what was number one. Mm, mm. And, um, and, that, and it was definitely 
um, a big national interest. And I'm not, when, when, as we travel around the world, I'm always aware that I made this remark actually at, at Dusty Springfield's funeral when I, when I said a few words about Dusty, that British people take pop music really seriously in a way that I don't think Americans do unless they're particularly interested in pop music, whereas in Britain it's always been a very strong general interest. I mean, in the introduction to your book, you write, it's extremely interesting, you write autobiographically about how you started to first write lyrics and so forth. And I suppose one of the things I wondered was how important do you think being a fan is to being able to write a great pop song? Well, it's being a fan, as I mentioned, for instance, of the Beatles, um, that gives you the spark um, that makes you think, I want to try that. Um, and the Beatles were a very, very musical... I mean, that, the 60s period was, was so musical in that every week an incredibly unforgettable record, at least one, if not five, came out that we would still, if you're the right generation, we'd still know now. Um, and so that, was, so that made you want to join in. Um, and, you know, one of my earliest ambitions as a child was first to be an actor, but I realised when I joined a, a theatre group, I wasn't very good, was to be um, a, pop, a pop star and to write my own songs. And I taught myself, as I say in the introduction, to play the guitar. And this is where I'm disagreeing for what you've just said. I then couldn't be bothered to work out other people's chords. So I'd start playing a song on a chord, and then I'd start writing something based on that chord myself. And that, and they were, they were rubbish, these songs, but, <laughs> but, but there was something exciting about doing it, and I really got the bug for doing that uh, from a very early age. Because yeah, you, <clears throat> and I'm probably going to get my name wrong, but you had an early folk experience with a, did you have a, an outfit called Dust, am I right in thinking? Well, I was in a group called, my first group was called Dust. And this was a bit, so we'd gone through the 60s, um, and I'd, you know, I could play the Beatles songs on the guitar and, and other, I think I mentioned the book we had on our piano at home, the, the assorted songs of, from Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, I've always liked Chim Chimini, Chim Chimini, Chim Chim Taru. It's a good, try, but it's a good chord change. And, and then I met a friend who was obsessed by the Incredible String Band. Now, if you ever heard the Incredible String Band, when you first hear them, you think it's ghastly beyond belief. And then you realize it's, just, it's one of those rare uh, groups of musicians or artists. They're their own culture. You probably know like the Incredible String well, Band. Oddly, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just going to advance because here, uh, question uh, 13 was justify your liking for the Incredible String Band. <laughs> ah, well, uh, well, we can jump forward to question 13. Um, <clears throat> well, they wrote songs that were a strange and some uneasy mixture of, of folk music, Scottish folk music, blues, and also, of course, the important thing, psychedelia. I've always liked psychedelic music. And that combination, and, and also the fact that they weren't ruthlessly professional, although good musicians, they brought in non-musicians to play with them. And it created a sort of tension which made them really, really special. And, and of course they did, when we started going to see them at Newcastle City Hall, they would do semi-theatrical productions. Um, and that always put in my head the idea that if you're going to be some... And then of course David Bowie comes along, he's probably question 14. Um, <laughs> when he came along and he was theatrical as well, it sort of, put, it sort of linked in my brain pop music with theatre. I mean... I think we're actually swiftly turning this event into a seminar on the incredible <laughs> string band. But I, I did. I but did, that's I, what. Sorry, yeah. th your question was, that's where Dust came from. So we had a group that, like the incredible string band, had two guys playing guitars and two girls singing, and we called them Dust. Good name. Um, 
<laughs> you did once, I think, coming back to the incredible string band, you did once have a, an interesting theory that they were the sort of missing link before T-Rex. Well, T-Rex started off, Tyrannosaurus Rex, as a sort of knockoff of the Incredible String Band and supported, <laughs> we're still on the Incredible String Band, and supported the Incredible String Band in the early days. Um, so, yeah, they, so, but for me personally, in between the Beatles and David Bowie, which is not a very long period, it's about two years, mm -hmm. there was um, the Incredible String Band and then T-Rex. Yeah, yeah. Okay, moving on. Um, another slightly serious question, um, but it does come across in the lyrics. I mean, obviously one of your biggest hits, the Pet Shop Boys, It's a Sin. And you do write in the introduction to the book, and you've spoken about it before in interviews, about having a Roman Catholic education. Now, I mean, within the literary world, obviously being a Roman Catholic is, you know, has, can have, think of Graham Greene, Evelyn War, you know, it can have a, a big effect on your writing. Do you think that your Roman Catholic background shaped your attitude to writing, shaped your subject matter, or did it just shape everything and your writing with it? Again, it's a bit like an incredible string band. It gave me a, se <laughs> <laughs> it gave me a sense of theatre. I mean, I was an altar boy from the age of seven or eight. And, you know, when I was eight years old, I would get on my bicycle and drive to the Sacred Heart Church in North Gosforth for eight o'clock mass. And me and the priest would do the whole Latin mass in about, in less than 20 minutes, with an audience of three old ladies. And there was, and it gave me a sense of theater, because he wore mm. interesting costumes, mm. and there was, and on Sundays there was incense, and, and it That's definitely psychedelic. It gave me a sense of ritual, which I've always... You know, it's no accident in our first tour, directed by Derek Jarman, I'm dressed as the Pope. Mm, mm, mm. It comes from being an altar yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> which leads us on a slightly Catholic question, actually, uh, which <laughs> is how important is personal sadness and internal conflict to being, <laughs> to being a writer? How, what's, wait, what's the question? Um, <laughs> how, how, in, okay. how important is personal sadness or and or internal conflict to creativity? I probably don't think of either of them, but they're, they're probably... Another, you know, you said about living through the war. I think, I thought you were going to say that our generation's war was AIDS. Uh, Are we, was, was living through, which we still do, um, but maybe not in such a totally tragic way, in terms of Britain anyway. And, um, you know, when Chris and I became famous, this is also mentioned in one of the commentaries to the songs in the book, my best friend who was in dust, it's called Chris Dell, um, came back from Sri Lanka where he was teaching, and, and he had a very bad cold and all the rest of it. And we were doing, Chris and I were doing promotion for suburbia, and he, suddenly phoned up, and his partner phoned me up and said, we turned to a hospital. And you suddenly realized, when those, in those days, HIV was regarded as the beginning of AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, and that he, had, um, that he had AIDS. And so for all of those years of, of left my own devices and it's a sin and mm -hmm. making records with Dusty and stuff, um, I was in St. Mary's Hospital, Paddington, visiting this very close friend of mine who was just dying gradually, you know, and there were good days and bad days. And, and it was impossible for that not to go in the songs. But I remember when we wrote, it couldn't happen here. That was about, um, it couldn't happen here was referring to AIDS. And the fact, this is in the book as well, that we had, me and Chris, had, me and Chris, Dowell, uh, Christopher Dowell, had had a conversation 
where he was saying that he'd read, oh, it wasn't going to happen in Britain like it did in the United States. Um, and then, of course, it, it did. Um, and so it really informed everything I wrote, or a lot of what I wrote. But it couldn't happen here as a very oblique lyric because I wrote it and I didn't really want Chris Dowell to know what it was about mm. in case he was upset by it. Mm. So it's, it's a very sort of poetic lyric and rather oblique because I didn't want to say it um, in, a very, in, a, in an obvious way. And that, you know, went on, um, you know, as you know, through Your Funny Uncle and, and Being Boring and it goes on to The Survivors, which I think comes out in 1996. And after that, I didn't know anyone else who died of AIDS. Um, but during that, the first 10 years of the Pet Shop Boys, I knew, you know, a lot of people who, who disappeared because of this. And so that had a profound effect. I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, I think I first interviewed you and Chris probably in 1989 for Blitz magazine with the writer John Wilde. And at that time, the two words which were thrown around about Pet Shop Boys, it seemed to you, if, if you were a journalist, was, you know, that it was melancholy and that it was ironic. And I've seen, I, I, I think the melancholy persists in your writing. I mean, I think every album has normally one or two melancholy songs on it. I never really got the irony thing, though. Um, did you, could you actually maybe talk a little bit about both those? It down to when you write something which later you feel is very melancholy. Um, but also, you know, have you ever felt that what you're doing is ironic or is you? Well, we've, you know, we, right at the beginning we wrote, let's spend lots of money which was a satire. And, and, and the famous line, the line, let's get lots of money, was actually an idea. And so we wrote this kind of ironic satire about Thatcherism and that whole loads of money thing that was just, I mean, that was in 1983, you know. And, um, but I think that was, became such a famous song that everyone assumed that everything we did was a sort of ironic satire. And, and, it, and I always say to people, you know, if you listen to our first album, it's so full of, um, of heartfelt longing, and, uh, you know. Um, but the satire and the irony is obviously creatively stronger for the audience. That people, maybe that was more original, because there's a lot of pop music of melancholy and longing, but there's not that much. Uh, I mean, there's Ray Davies, you know. Um, there's not that much satire and irony uh, in pop music like there is in, in a sort of bow of longing, which there's gazillions. Um, but both would, had a truth for us. Um, I mean, Chris and I have satirical personalities, particularly Chris, I think, in fact, probably more than me. And... Um, and and I have a sort of, I don't know, romantic sentiment and awareness of the gap between desire and reality or something, I don't know. And, and, and music can fill that gap very easily. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting when, I mean, the, the, the landscape of pop music in 1985-86, until like, in other words, when West End Girls came out, was sort of kind of interesting. It was very eclectic and, you know, there'd been a lot going on. When you wrote West End Girls, did, where did you see it fitting into the pop landscape of its time? Or did you not really see it fitting anywhere? I mean, did you sort of... Was... Well, this was quite an exciting time for us because the lyric of West End Girls was written in, I think, 1983, early 83. And we recorded the first version in 83. And this was an exciting musical time for me and Chris because we thought that we liked music that most people didn't like. And, we, and, and, it was, and that music was basically gay disco, which became high energy music. And finally, by the end of the 80s, became Stock Egg and Waterman, the sound of pop. Um, and the other music was the early hip hop, uh, like Grandmaster Flash, Planet Patrol, uh, and all those records coming out of New York in particular. And so 
Dream is instrumental, and I just had this idea for a rap in the style of the message by Grandmaster Flash. And so West End Girls has the same rhythm in the spoken parts as the rap of the message by Grandmaster Flash. And that, at the time, was original. It wasn't everywhere. It wasn't in the latest Spandau Ballet or Duran record. Um, and so it was an exciting period because we felt we had something that other people didn't have. We weren't we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, the only people who have it, but we knew that no one who was really successful in Britain was doing this kind of thing. I mean, do you feel that over the years your lyrics, I mean, reading the book, that your lyrics have become more complex, more... Um, I mean, I think sometimes listening, reading the lyrics of, you know, the first two albums, for instance, um, they seem, shall I say, more pared down. Um, then you sort of look at a later song, say something like The King of or Passing Over in Hell, or Love is a Bourgeois Con uh, Constructor, things like that. They're lyrically, they're quite complex, they're quite wordy. And I was wondering whether you feel that your writing as a lyricist has become denser, if you want. Well, I try not, I try for it not to be dense because at the end of the day, it's pop music and that's not really a medium for density, if that's the right <laughs> word. Um, so, but there is, it's undoubtedly a fact for any songwriter or any, or any artistic practice really, that at the beginning, they probably have a few very direct ideas that they then develop. And I think that's no different with us, because I also think musically, we've, you know, you just, you've, you've written so many songs, you know more about it. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I would, I like to be, I really like to be direct, uh, but then I suppose you have an idea of where you could take a pop song. Some as you have an idea where you could take, how to write a Pet Shop Boys pop song, like Love is a Bourgeois Construct. You think of that, and you think, oh, that's a really Pet Shop Boys kind of idea, isn't it? Um, and it's sort of great when, you, when that you stumble across something like that. So I don't deliberately try to be more sophisticated. I guess it's just part of growing older and experience. Because, I mean, the other thing <coughs> that I'm sure <coughs> when people read the book, if you haven't read it or, already, um, the annotations that you give to each lyric are incredibly interesting and reveal all kinds of fascinating insights into your lyric writing process. And one of the things that I was struck by was that you're a very close and serious reader of social and political history. And there must be more than half a dozen lyrics out of the ones in the book where you say in the annotation that you know it's, it, it was inspired by or as a reference to sometimes some really quite complex aspects of modern European history and things. Well, I, pro I mean, when, when, in, in, in compiling the book and then writing the commentary for each one, I actually, after a while, became embarrassed by... I thought, God, all I do is nick these ideas from books. <laughs> um, and I was sort of quite surprised how many there were. To be honest, I didn't think I did it that often. Um, but I suppose what I'm trying to do is take something, just a little aspect of something from a book that interests me and put it in a pop song. And also I try to put it, as it's a pop song, to put it in a... Well, there's two things. I think in a pop song you can say mysterious things mm -hmm. that you don't necessarily have to understand. Mm. I mean, when John Lennon wrote Strawberry Fields Forever, mm. you sort of understood it and you sort of didn't. And there's mm. something sort of great about that. Mm. And I've, that kind of song, Incredible String Band, of course, mm. um, we're very much like that. Um, I've always liked that kind of song. Bob Dylan, I mean, there's many Bob Dylan songs you don't really understand. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and Bob Dylan actually has always been, of many years, has been quite a strong influence on me. Mm. And um, I forgot what I'm talking about. Actually, you, you're... Um, <laughs> <laughs> well... <clears throat> Actually, 
this allows me to mention um, T.S. Eliot and um, who's the other one? Um, fame. Who wrote The Big Sleep? Who wrote, who wrote The Big name? Sleep? Raymond Chandler. Raymond Chandler. Raymond Chandler, yeah. Because both T.S. Eliot and Raymond Chandler have pointed out that sometimes things not making sense gives them tremendous power. I mean, Eliot was convinced that a lot of the kind of mythic attention that the wasteland attracted was because people couldn't understand a lot of it. And like I've certainly never understood it. Um, but, this, but the poetry of it, the different voices talking about strange and disparate yeah. and even exotic things is completely mm. riveting and makes you want to read it again and again. Mm. 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 Gets hoping to find more meaning. Yeah. I mean, I've always been a great... I love those songs of yours like King of Rome and Legacy, um, Requiem and Denim and Leopard Skin and things which are, are quite long and um, have that quality to them. Well, it's, you know, a lot, often... It's about the sound of the words, um, and that words have a beauty, and you think, well, I want this to sound, I'd rather this sounded beautiful than made sense, and sometimes making sense will Yeah, I mean, which brings me conveniently to question 6A, <coughs> <laughs> which is, um, obviously, you've written a musical. Here you mentioned Mary Poppins. I share your admiration for Mary Poppins. Um, and I wanted to ask you, to what extent have musicals influenced your writing? Well, growing up in the 60s, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we had a graphone, as we used to call them in those days, and we had pop singles, and then my parents had a handful of albums, and they had the best-selling LP of the 1960s, the soundtrack. Oh. Of the sound of music, and um, they had the original cast recording of My Fair Lady with Rex Harrison, Julie Andrews. I can't think what they had. That was about. Oh, they had they had strange things like Ray the Ray, Ray Conniff and his orchestra, and mm. Bert Camford, and these mm. were middle of the road sort of dinner party music records. Mm. Mm. Actually, funny enough, that like, easy listening we would now call it. Yeah. A sound always, probably because of imbibing it to such early age, I've always quite liked that easy listening sound as well. And there's even a sort of minor influence on the Pet Boys. Or but um, My Fair Lady had a big influence because all these witty, sort of post-Gilbert and Sullivan lyrics. And I, I could have recited the whole thing, from, I probably still could actually, from start to finish. And that definitely... I remember when I was on Desert Island Discs a few years ago, yeah. I decided to choose the records in... Um, chronological order and so like the first or second record was something from My Fair Lady and I realized you know why can't the English speak that teach their children how to speak this mm. little class distinction by now should be antique that these things have had an effect mm. on the way um, the way mm. I write Ricks now I mean there's a few really great Pet Shop, Pet Shop Boys songs that to me seem to come straight from the world of musicals and I wonder if you'd agree with them I mean one would be Decadence Yes. Stop this caprice, you've got to cease this fantasy act of pretense, you know. Another one would be Shameless. Shameless we actually, we actually put in our musical, because it was just, like, it filled, it was exactly the right yeah. song to the scene. And I mean, for me, I mean, one of the, I had quite a teary moment the other week, because I was reading your book. The great thing about the book is that it makes you listen to the records again. So I read the book and I immediately listened to Fundamental and revisited that record. And in doing so, listened to Indefinite Leave to Remain, um, which is a amazing... I mean, that would be a huge hit in a musical, I'm sure. In a, I mean, what, you didn't write it for the musical, did you? No, it's... Um, it just describes a scene that c comes out of uh, a memoir. It's, it's uh, John Lennon's wife, Cynthia Lennon, as I say in the book. Um, Okay, I read her memoir, and, she, and Cynthia Lennon came back from holiday, and she came back home to the house she shared with her husband, John Weybridge in Surrey, and she went into the house to say, oh, we're all going into London for dinner, are you going to come? And there was John sitting on the sofa 
with Yoko, sort of intertwined with Yoko. And she says something along the lines of, she realized at that point, it was the marriage was finished. And I just felt, thought what a, what an awful moment of realization. And also she dealt with it in a very English way of being a bit embarrassed and a sort of apologizing and leaving. It's interesting because you're, you're recalling a song you wrote called I Made My Excuses and Left. What did you just say, sorry? Indefinite Leave to Remain. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've got the same number of words in the title, probably. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's a link. Yeah. There's a well, they're link. On the, to be fair, they're on the same album. They're on the uh, same. There's, there's another link. Now then, what were you saying about indefinitely? Oh, I was saying. Uh, I thought it went a bit quiet there. Uh, um, <laughs> well, it definitely <laughs> remain. I'll just launch it anyway. Um, we have a friend um, who uh, comes from Sri Lanka, and he lived here for a long time, and he. Uh, finally got British citizenship yeah. and I signed his form and the form was called or the, it was called indefinite leave to remain or that was the certificate you got when you when you got citizenship and I said wow what a, be what a beautiful phrase indefinite leave mm. to remain and I it immediately suggested to me the idea of a of a love song mm. where two people have been together and broken up and mm. one of them wants has realized mm. it's all a mistake and wants to come back yeah. and wants to get married um, mm. And um, that's, what was the question? Well, no, that was, I think we've, um, uh, yeah. The point just, being that there's a lot of poetry in, I think that's the biggest, you know, source for me. Yeah, I think also not wanting to embarrass you, I think that um, indefinite leave to remain in my book is one of the greatest love songs I've ever heard. I think it's... Thank you. Um, Thank you. Well, I can't really think like that. But when we wrote it, I was... Um, we wrote it in Naples, actually. I was... Uh, I, I, it was, again, it was, I love the sound of the words, just this phrase, definitely from it. Um, there's a, another um, question. The Chris Heath, who has worked with you a lot, the writer, um, wrote an absolutely amazing book called Pet Shop Boys vs. America. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what a great book. I think it's going to be republished by Penguin. Yeah. And the yeah. other one, literally, I think. Yeah. The way in discussions, anyway. Yeah. yeah. And um, he gives this most amazing account of an early Pet Shop, a relatively early Pet Shop Boys tour to, Amer to America. Um, and then I was looking at the lyric book and I was really interested to notice, or I felt, that whereas an awful lot of um, writers in pop and rock music are inspired by the glamour of America, of Americana, reading your lyrics and particularly reading the annotations to them, it seems that you are almost more inspired by the glamour of Russia and Eastern Europe um, is that true, that mm. you're really more, probably more sort of turned on artistically by Russia and the East than you are by the States? I had the thought of it as a sort of competition with America, but yeah, it's undoubtedly, it's undoubtedly the case. Um, I, when I was very young, I, I bought it a jumble sale or something, a book, I was about 10 years old, a book about the Russian Revolution. And... I don't know, there was just something about that incredibly drastic change, and yet change that in some ways doesn't happen. So there's a change from, from autocratic monarchic government communism, but it's autocratic communism. Um, and then there's all incredible culture. I mean, there's music, Tchaikovsky and Stravinsky, and... and uh, and the art that comes out of that period, and poetry like Anna Akhmatova, and it's, you know, the art that comes out of pain, mm. um, that's so powerful, um, mm. that I, you know, even now I 
there's nothing I like reading more than all I, I try to try to ration myself because I think it's almost unhealthy. But I um, I, I like to listen to read mm. Russian history. American history is more familiar to us, or mm. American recent history is more familiar mm. to us. And the surface of American culture is, of course, totally fascinating. Mm. Mm. Um, but there's something, and also Russia doesn't reveal itself easily, to put it mm. politely, and and I think that is fascinating as well. Yeah, because it's interesting. Even in on Nightlife, I think there's a song called Happiness is an Option, where that has a Slavic um, proverb in the middle of it, doesn't it? Well, well, I cl someone told me it's not a, someone t a Russian told me th this proverb does not exist in Russia, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And I said, really? And the proverb is something <laughs> about um, man is born under a blue sky but dies in the middle of a dark forest. There you go. You see, I've got, I've got Russians down here are confirming that this is simply not true. <laughs> it's, it's quite a good proverb. Maybe I invented it. I don't think I did, though, because um, I'm busy reading a book at the moment about a memoir. Oh, I think he might be here, by Luke Turner, and it's, mm. about, it's mm. about forests and sex and all sorts of things. And I keep thinking, man is born under a blue sky but dies in the middle of a dark forest, mm. which is not a proverb in Russia. Maybe it's Polish. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, uh, maybe it's German. No, um, it's not German. Maybe it's Finnish from northern Finland. Yeah, yeah. Um, Shall we settle for Finland? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, I still think it's true. Uh, mm. and, and I was under the impression, because I read it in a book of Russian proverbs, that it was, um, yeah. that it was Russian. Maybe it was fake yeah. news. Yeah. Um, okay. But, um, well, sorry, what's the point about yeah, this? I, of blood? <laughs> <clears throat> I think the, in the Incredible String Band, however, did. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, <clears throat> have you ever set out to write a funny song? Oh, yes. Um, my mind's gone blank now. Um, well, when we wrote I'm Stupid, it was sort of meant to be funny. Yeah. Um, mm. But there are probably... Uh, shameless. Yeah. We're shameless, we will do anything to get our 15 minutes of fame. Mm. We have no integrity, we're ready to crawl. To obtain celebrity, we'll do anything at all. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like Gilbert and Sullivan, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is like, yeah, yeah it's that's Sullivan. sort of that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because, I mean, I remember once interviewing um, Malcolm McDowell, the film actor, and um, him, him saying how he felt that sort of often artists are, are too ready to sort of disregard humour because they sort of think they shouldn't do it or something. And yet it's such a mainstay um, in many ways. And um, Well, humour and pop music is... A, it's, a, it's tricky. It's, it's tricky because pop music is always meant to be sort of sexy and humour, as we all know, um, is, doesn't really work necessarily in that situation. And... Um, <sighs> And you're, when you're in an era, an era of comedy songs, I mean, again, Ray Davies, you know, um, for a dedicated follower of fashion or something, mm. is, um, but it's not what they now call laugh out loud mm. funny. It's mm. wry, sardonic humour. Mm. That works pretty well in pop music. I remember on the first night of Closer to Heaven, our musical, when the manager, um, the guy playing the manager, Saunders, came on stage and sang, I have to admit, I'm an absolute shit. At least you can't call me a hypocrite. And the audience laughed. It mm. was a great feeling. Yeah. It yeah. Was, I, I realized what comedians must like. When you say something, everyone laughs. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, this is the first of two Brian Eno-related questions. Okay. Um, the first is, Brian Eno once told me that pop music isn't about making music in the traditional sense of the word. It's about creating new imaginary worlds and inviting people to join them. Is that true? Well, it's something we've tried to do. Um, when we first, Chris and I first started writing songs together, then it became the Pet Shop Boys, and we, we took it pretty seriously right from the beginning, I think. But 
we had the idea that we were creating our own world. We've said this many times in interviews. And, um, and that we might invite people into it, like Dusty Springfield or whatever. But we didn't, didn't necessarily have to refer to other people's music, uh, to, uh, by which you meant contemporary pop music. And so that we could have influences that other people didn't have, like early hip hop or Russian culture or something like that. And, and we would make something that, was, that people could say, oh, that's very Pet Shop Boys. I don't know if you thought it was through quite as calculatingly as that, mm. but it was more a sort of instinct of taste and mm. subject matter. And, but I think we, we, to some extent, we did. I know because I often mm. read record reviews where people say, oh, the Pet Shop Boys-esque, such and such. Mm. And so I think to some extent we succeeded mm. with that. I mean, this is a little off the subject of the lyrics, but certainly in the staging of your music and the sort of uh, costumes and makeup and so on, if one thinks about, say, pointy hats, period, Pet Shop Boys, or mm. nightlife, period, Pet Shop Boys, I mean, it's almost like at times you play with Pet Shop Boys like they're kind of comic book c characters or... You know, something is well, I think it's trying, it's Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe trying to back away from it a bit <laughs> and, and replace ourselves with versions of ourselves, which feels a bit more comfortable. Because um, it feels like it takes the spotlight off you as a real person and puts it on these pet shop boys. And uh, well, actually, I think probably quite a lot of performers do that, actually. Um, but it is, it makes it easier. Do you sort of then, would you sort of agree with Oscar Wilde's notion that if you give a man a mask, he'll tell the truth? Well, it's, well actually I've never heard that before. Have you? No, I don't think so, no. It's, 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 I probably, I would have to think about it more, but I think so, yes. I mean, another thing which, I remember I spoke to you and Chris not so very long ago, and you said this interesting thing about how Adam Ant's line, ridicule is nothing to be scared of, was very important to Pet Shop Boys. Well, only because, I mean, that's what Adam Ant was doing in the very early 80s, you know. Um, and I assume that's why he sang that. It's, it's true, actually. I, you know, Andy Wall said, if you're doing something that everyone hates, you must be doing something right. And we've all, Chris always quotes that. Mm. And, um, and, I, and I think there is, I think we've had periods where we do that. Mm -hmm. uh, which ones? <laughs> Nightlife in particular. <laughs> well, actually, no, um, release in particular. Um, uh. No. Yeah, you see, the Russians didn't like it release. <laughs> um, <laughs> I loved release. I like release I, too, yeah, yeah. yeah. I liked it because it was, you were doing the whole thing about constructed authenticity. We might not have put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 